heads and say a prayer. Lord, as we gather in your house today, we, we pray for your blessing on us. We worship, open our eyes as we study your word, help us to understand. Through all of it, increase our faith and our understanding, Lord God, not only of your love, but how you would have us live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So you sang some strange words just now. Oh, I forgot. I have to start with the greeting, right? I forgot. My brothers and sisters. Did you notice the strange words that you just sang? Hallelujah. Praise the one who sets me free. Context tell us free from what? Sin, Sin death, right? Especially death, right? Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Pray the grave. What is it? Law, death has lost its grip on me. Everybody dies. I mean, unless Jesus comes in his glory before you die, every single one of us is going to die. So how in the world can we say death has lost its grip on, on me? Even talks in there about the fact that, I, that there is no fear anymore. Our world is terrified of death. <clears throat> terrified. Absolutely terrified, not only of death itself, but of the consequences of what of, of dying, what might come after dying, what we leave behind when we die. Death is a powerful, controlling thing. And our world lives in constant fear. To the point where there are those who would say, suggest, that because you're going to die someday, you don't know how long you're going to be here, you have to live your life now for yourself to the fullest or you're going to miss out. i got to take advantage of the time that I have here because I don't know how much time I have left and I don't know when death is going to come, so I had better live my life now and do everything that I want to take advantage of now because I don't want to look back on my life and live and have regret because I didn't get to do this and I didn't get to do that. Not that there's anything wrong with trying to live life and enjoy the things that God places in front of you, but if your goal is to live the fullest, best life here on this side of heaven, there's going to be a problem. And what's the problem? That this side of heaven is corrupted with sin. It's broken. No matter how hard we try to live our best and fullest life, we will never do it because this side of heaven doesn't work right. <coughs> our world does everything it can to prolong life and avoid death. But when they meet a Christian who has a death-defying faith, lives a death-defying life, some strange things happen. Some powerful things happen. Jesus, we've been looking at Jesus, John chapter 11, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus dies. Jesus stays away for a while. They bury him in the ground. Jesus comes, comforts his sister, raises Lazarus from the dead. Actually raises him from the dead. And some amazing things happen. I want to talk about the aftermath of the resurrection of Lazarus. So you can follow along with me in your, in your bulletin. I'm going to read the end of John chapter 11, and then I'm going to read a section from John 12 because of the matches. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is that man performing every mirac uh, many miraculous signs. If we tell him to go, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away our place in our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than for the whole nation to perish. He did not say this on his own, but as a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for the na that nation, 
but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from, from the country in Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the feast at all? But the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. And then skipping ahead into chapter 12. <clears throat> Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus does this amazing thing. He raises Lazarus from the dead. <clears throat> Two very opposite things happen, right? First is that a whole bunch of people began to what? Yeah, believe. They began to put their faith in Jesus. To be free of the power of death. To be free and know that you will live again. That this thing that seems so permanent where we die and we get put in a hole in the ground... Dirt gets poured over top, of that, over top of us and they sell off all our stuff is not permanent. That this can be reversed and that Jesus has the power to reverse even death was a powerful thing and everybody wanted to know how you could be free of the power of death. The word there in the Greek, it says many were coming to Jesus and some went to tell the Pharisees. It really was uh, the vast majority were putting their faith in Jesus and a few went to tell on him to the Pharisees. <clears throat> Huge numbers of people were coming to faith in Jesus because Lazarus was walking around living a life that was death-defying. Just by his breathing, he defied death because everyone knew that he had died. He was a prominent man. Everyone knew him. He was right outside Jerusalem, lived right there. People came out. They saw him dead. They saw him put in the cave in the, in the side of the hill. Now he's walking around, talking, breathing. His very existence defied death, showed that Christ had the power to free us from death. And now what a witness it was, right? All kinds of people coming to faith in Christ Jesus. Maybe that's what we need as a church, right? Who wants to volunteer to die and be raised again? <laughs> Nobody? Yeah, God hasn't done that with any of us, put any of us to death and brought us back to life. I don't think so. He hasn't done that. What a witness it would be if we could live a death-defying life. A life that said, I am not afraid of death because God can reverse death and change death. Well, you know where I'm going, right? You don't have to die and be raised again live a death-defying faith and have a death-defying life. A life that says, I know that there is a life after this life, that I live my life because I know that there is a life to come. We can do that every day. There's a common hope of eternal life. Hope to see our loved ones again in heaven with Christ Jesus. Hope that even through death, God can bring good out of that. And also live a death-defying faith when, when death is on the table, the doctor gives us bad news. We hear something that isn't so wonderful about mom or dad. I don't panic because I know that God is in control of what? Both of us. And even the timing of my death is in God's hands. Living a death-defying faith. And the world will see that. When these things come into our lives and we deal with this in faith in Christ Jesus, knowing that there's an eternity waiting for us, knowing that this is not the end, so to speak. But we deal with these things and trust in Jesus Christ that he is over all and in all and he can work through all. That even death can be reversed, will be reversed through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? But I think maybe one of the greatest ways that we can live a death-defying faith, a 
live a death-defying life is by asking ourselves, who do we live for? What do we live for? If I truly believe that this world is broken, and it is, and I truly believe that when I get to heaven, that's when I will live my truest, best life. I don't live this life for me. I live it instead for the one who, who died for me, who saved me, who has given me a home waiting for him in heaven. Am I living my life for, for, for earthly success? Am I living my life so that I can do what I want? Am I living my life for money and for success and for... What am I living my life for? This to the world. When our world sees you and me living our lives for Christ, living our lives for our fellow man, giving of ourselves, of our time, of our money, to help others, to love others, that flies in the face of what the world says about this life. It's a death-defying life. It says, I know that I have another chance to live. That chance, that vast majority of people seem to be coming to faith in Jesus Christ, but there was a few people, when they heard about the resurrection, what did they want to do? They wanted to kill Jesus. And not only kill Jesus, but they wanted to kill who? Lazarus. What had Lazarus done? He had done absolutely nothing. And they're going to kill Lazarus because he was an affront to them. Because they were afraid of what this was going to do to their position and their power. Notice the Pharisees never denied the fact that Jesus did these miraculous signs. All they were worried about was the fact that they were going to lose their position. They were going to lose the life and the power that they had set up. They were not willing to sacrifice that for the sake of the resurrection. It's a strange thing. It's a very strange thing. Because as afraid as mankind is of death, you would think that the message of the resurrection, that Christ can undo and will undo death, would be the greatest news that there is, and everyone would come running. But it isn't true, is it? This day, it is the resurrection that the enemies of God want to destroy first and foremost. To talk about an actual physical resurrection from the dead. It's, it's, it's meaning, I do not fear you, because I know that Christ has conquered you for me. I pray that the Lord God would give each one of us a faith that trusts in him completely, to know that even in the face of death we have nothing to fear because Christ has conquered it for us. To remember that even when death comes and, and we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that we will fear nothing. Why? Because God is we live our lives not for ourselves because we have one shot at this, but because we live our lives for Christ who loves us. I pray that the Lord would give us a death of life.